Welcome everybody to our Behind the Fluff Inspiring the Next CMO podcast series. Now you can find lots of great resources on our website www.internationalbunch.com forward slash be inspired. Today I am so so happy and delighted to have Rachel Fadlan with me. Now Rachel is an industry marketing director and someone I've actually met through this process and has been recommended to me and uh, we spoke for the first time a couple of months ago and Rachel is definitely a girl after my own heart and she is absolutely awesome. So hello Rachel. Hello. Thank you for having me. No problem. So the first thing that we always start off with is we have a campaign that we do called hashtag in bunch word of the day and we love to find out from the community what your favorite word is and why. Okay. So what's your favorite word? Well, I'm going to have to go with shenanigans. Um, if, it's, if it's not already fairly clear why, it's a very fun word. I like to incorporate it into sentences really as much as possible. Um, and also, I'm a bit of a mischief maker myself. So uh, I just enjoy shenanigans. And I just think the word is almost an onomatopoeia. It, it feels like mis- mischievous to me, the word. It does. What an excellent word. I hope that you just bring them up into like serious meetings. Some course I do. Yeah. <laughs> I, I always try to introduce shenanigans as much as possible. <laughs> <laughs> That's absolutely brilliant. Um, okay, so first things first, we want to know a bit more about you. So what is the best thing that you have discovered in this last year, year and a half since we've been in this funny old pandemic? Okay. Bear with me. I'm going to say it's my kids, and I'm not being sarcastic and I'm not trying to be funny. I discovered them in a new way. Um, My daughter is 17, almost 18, and my son is 15, very soon to be 16. And during this last year, my husband is an administrator at a private school and he was in person all year. Whereas my children and I were home, I was working remote and they were studying remote the entire year. So yeah, Um, I discovered well, my children just are just lovely human beings and they, I got to know them in a way, in a, I think a more intimate way than I've been able to their whole lives because we literally had a year of uninterrupted time together. They, one of the, my favorite things from this last year was when we were able and when I didn't have meetings, we sat together every day for lunch and I've never gotten to do that with my kids. So I just feel like I've gotten to know them. I was lucky enough to get to know my kids in a way that I wouldn't have been able to before. And I feel really grateful. Yeah, I think that's 100 percent right. And I think that a lot of parents and people out there that will really resonate with them, whether it's a a child or a family member. I think there's a lot that can be said for the, the valuable, concentrated time that we've actually spent with those people that we never really had the opportunity to do before. And, and even if it was forced on us, it's just, um, yeah, I, it, it very much resonates with me. Last year, Poppy was in, you know, she was um, two, two and a half. And, um, and she goes to nursery every day, um, Monday to Friday. So for me to actually have to spend time with her, but like you, I mean, we work, we all work remotely here anyway, but to be forced to spend that valuable time with her, it was just, yeah. They are amazing, aren't they? They they are absolutely amazing human beings. They really, they, and I can't say this strongly enough, kept me sane during the year. I'm a a really social extroverted person and it was a hard year also for my kids. And they really like, I don't know if they'd say the same about the past year as I'm saying right now, but (laughs) I don't know if I drove them crazy, but it was just lovely. I mean, we found so many things to do together that yeah it it was just an invaluable time and now they're away at they go to a sleepaway camp over the summer they've gone for years this is the first time where I am like yearning physically to see them I miss it I can't believe how much I miss I miss them not not being home it's yeah Yeah. the whole new you don't know what to do with yourself do you no what I mean what do I do without my children we had our routine we had our little meals we had our shows we watched I can't watch any shows because they're I have to wait for them Oh, no. <laughs> oh, I'm sure that they'll be at your camp, you know, maybe on their phone, they'll be watching these shows and they'll come back and go, no, mom, I didn't watch that show. Let's they watch it together. Not. 
Well, I'll tell you what, the campers, my son, they're not allowed to have any electronics there. Oh, they'll be fine. So, <laughs> yeah, he definitely did it. Now, my daughter, who's a counselor, that's quite possible that she did do that. Yeah. <laughs> you just can't help it, can you? My husband and I like that. We'll start watching a series together, and then he's like, he's like, oh, you know, should we watch that? And I'm like, oh, I'm on season seven now. Sorry. <laughs> do the same thing. I'm a, I'm a binge watcher. <laughs> yeah. Oh, brilliant. So... <laughs> Who inspires you, Rachel? Um, you know, I think that's a, that's a big question. Um, I don't have a specific person in mind. I just, there are so many people that inspire me all the time in so many different ways. I, I am, I just, I get inspired. I am inspired by just tough, resilient People. I'm inspired by people who are not afraid to speak their minds, especially there, you know, there are so many things going on in the world today. And I am so inspired by people who aren't afraid to speak up and advocate for others. I, that's particularly been inspiring to me this last year is people's bravery and standing up, not just for themselves, but for other groups. Yeah, definitely. And I think, you know, it's, it's very important what you said. It's, you know, it's interesting when I ask this question, it usually isn't one person unless it's someone that's been very impactful on someone's lives. It's we take inspiration from all around us. And I think it would be rare, very rare to find someone that would only have one person, for example, that's ever inspired them. And I think absolutely taking strength from strong, resilient people and especially caregivers in the last year and you know, all these people who've been the frontliners, absolutely incredible how as humankind we can really bring the be. It's, yeah, it's a funny old year. Isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So when you were young, what did you want to be? This is where I get a little visual in my head, you know, when someone says like Superman or something, you know, I, I have these little images. Okay, well, so that's funny because when I was really young, if you asked me what I wanted to be, I would say an eagle um, because I just really wanted to fly. And then when <laughs> I just wanted wings and I wanted to fly. That, that's I got that's little, a bird to choose, isn't it? I mean, if you're going to go for a bird, yeah. go for an eagle. Go for the eagle, right for yeah. the eagle. That was what I wanted to be. But there's a little bit of a theme in that then. So when I got older, when people asked me what I wanted to be, I had this image in my head that I wanted to be the thing that was the hardest thing that you could be. So, and I was a kid. So I, you know, I'm like, what's the hardest thing? How, <laughs> what's the hardest? So I had, got in my head that the hardest thing in the whole world you could be is a brain surgeon. So I would say brain surgeon. It wasn't necessarily because I was interested in medicine. It was because I thought that was the hardest job in the whole world. That's what I was going to do. <laughs> I think it's brilliant. I thought you were going to say like president or something. <laughs> I apparently thought that brain surgeon was harder than president. Well, <laughs> that age. you know, a brain surgeon may actually say to you, yes, it is. Unless right. they've been a president and they can compare it. Right. So if you were to have dinner tonight with anybody alive, dead, doesn't matter where they are in the world, at what stage, who, and you can have as many or as little people as you want, it's up to you, it's your night. Um, who would you have? I'm going to say Golda Meir. Golda Meir was the fourth prime minister of the state of Israel. I think this woman was just a badass. I've been following her. I read her autobiography in middle school. I admire the hell out of this woman. She was a, twice an immigrant. She's originally from Kiev and her they're Jewish. Her and her family immigrated to um, the United States, to Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And then she, she sort of grew, her childhood was there. And then when she grew up, she immigrated to Israel at the time when Israel was just becoming a nation. This is a woman who had to learn a second language, adjust to a new culture. And again, as a woman in politics, anywhere in the world, it's not easy. And she, I just think she's incredible. She, she had to be one of the guys. She is tough as nails. She's amazing. She was a leader during, well, there, there are always rough times in Israel, but really during, you know, a historical time when there were wars going on. And I just think she is, I would, man, would I, what I would give to have dinner with her. Yeah. She sounds incredible. Tough as nails, amazing. And, you know, earlier you and I were having a discussion before we started the interview about um, 
having imposter syndrome and feeling nervous. And I would just love to ask someone like her, like, you seem so tough and confident. What, what's really going on behind the scenes there? Are you always tough and yeah. confident or do you quest, do you question what you do too? Do you get nervous? Do you have panic attacks? Do you, you know, um, I, that those sort of things are interesting to me. I bet she would really surprise you. I think so too. I think yeah. most people do. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. We are all human at the end of the day. And I think exactly. feeling nervous and that those kind of emotions, it tends to show that you care. So I think right. it's important because it also keeps you grounded as well. So um, let's talk about your career now. Tell me about your career and how you got to where you are today. Well, I had a rather winding path in my career. Um, and I will say that my illustrious marketing career started at a very small startup company in Jerusalem, Israel, where I was the office manager. Um, I was a poor, poor graduate student at the Hebrew University. I was getting a master's degree in Israeli politics and society because I don't know if you've noticed, I, I'm a little I'm fascinated by, by politics and did actually think I wanted to become a politician uh, in my naive youth. And in order to put myself through my master's program, I had a friend, friend who, you know, had, was part of the startup. And for me at the beginning, it was just a gig to pay my bills in the beginning. It was, you know, I was office manager. I was, it was interesting. It was something new. Um, I don't remember how long into it. I think the, the founders of the company saw that I, I had potential beyond being, you know, an, an administ administrative duties. So I quickly moved into the one and only marketing position in the company. And I loved it. I mean, I'd already had a knack for writing and I, I loved anything creative. And so it was just sort of, it sort of felt like a natural fit. Um, I will say that I've never had any formal training in marketing. I learned everything on the job. Um, and so I, I would say I spent my early years, my, my twenties in Israel kind of growing up in that world, in that marketing world and learning there. So the, the culture is very different than from where I am now in the States, but I think that's only been be beneficial and positive for me here. Yeah. Um, after that company went bankrupt, I found a job in another software company in Israel that's still there. And uh, just to put that in there. <laughs> Just so that yeah. it's not like a yeah, not this is not like when you go somewhere they go bankrupt. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I swear it wasn't me. It was not my my marketing skills. Wasn't my marketing um, budget spend? <laughs> <laughs> I swear. To be fair, I had zero um, in that company. You and were very in, creative, <laughs> like many of us have to be. Yeah, I love that. And well, that's what's fun about startups. Um, and then the next company that I went to was also love. You know, I I learned a lot there and. I was in high tech right at the time where the bubble burst. I don't know if you remember that. And everyone was getting laid off. So, and I found typically that the first people to get laid off are the marketers. Because as you said, I, I think the perception is that sales make money and marketing spends money. And so they typically let the marketing people go. So I lost another job. And at that point, I decided... Uh, that I would be open to marketing. It didn't have to be, at first I was, you know, looking for more high tech. Yeah. There really weren't any opportunities at the time. So I was very, very fortunate that at the time I was looking, there was a position available at Israel's National Holocaust Memorial. Wow. And so I got the position. I, I, I still feel so fortunate that, that I worked there. I was the liaison so I was the spokesperson for foreign media. Um, mm -hmm. And what I appreciate in Israel, which is very different than the US, your resume doesn't have to 100% align with what the role is. If they think you're a good fit and they think you have brains and they think you can figure it out, they'll hire you. So yeah. you can come from a totally different sector or position. And it's not like I feel in the US, they kind of silo you. Once you're on this track, you have yeah. to stay there because if you don't, you have to sort of start from the ground up again. Whereas in Israel, if they see that you could be a good fit, they, you can get the role. So I, yeah, I was very fortunate. So I, I kind of moved into this PR role, leading very large press conferences for international media. Mm -hmm. um, you know, at the time that I was there, 
Israel, the, the Holocaust Memorial was holding, I believe it was 50 years marking the time, you know, from the first uh, uprising from the, from the Holocaust, I believe that's what it was. And so we had a 50 year marking a huge ceremony where, you know, diplomats from all over, heads of state from all over the world attended. Yeah. And I was responsible for all of the, for the foreign media and for the press for, for that event. Um, Again, it just an absolutely incredible opportunity. And I appreciate the fact that in Israel, you can just learn things on the, on the job and they didn't expect you to know everything coming in. So it was an amazing opportunity. Um, yeah. After that, I, <laughs> excuse me, my husband and I moved to the States. Um, I'd had a daughter. And when we moved back to the States, I, <laughs> sorry, I had my daughter. She was about a year old, and then very soon after that became pregnant with my son and decided that I needed to take a step back and didn't really want, I had been interviewing for some rather large jobs in the, I live in the Boston area, in the Boston yeah. area. And it was like, you know what? I don't think I wanna do that right now. My kids are little. Yeah. I know how demanding these roles are. I'm gonna, I look for a part-time role in the Jewish community to stay connected for my own sanity, to get out of the house. And mm -hmm. really when my son went back, went to kindergarten, um, that's kind of full-time school here. I was like, okay, I'm ready to go back to work now. I yeah. like, I had no intention of staying home um, and was looking, but like I was saying earlier, it's challenging here to find a role when you've been out for a little bit and to get into a new country, new connections, a new network. It was hard, yeah. I, but I did, I was lucky again. I found a role in a nonprofit organization um, as the director of marketing and communications and did that for, I don't know, about five years. It was wonderful. We worked with um, national nonprofit organization that works with children, with Jewish students with disabilities. Yeah. Um, another incredible opportunity. And after, and luckily, um, I had a friend, Tamir, who you might know, who I think referred, who introduced the two of us. He did, um, yeah. He recommended you to this. <laughs> Tamir is wonderful. Uh, he had been at EBSCO for quite a while. And in fact, basically, since he started, kept saying to me, Rachel, I'm working at this great place. Every time a role in the marketing department came up, he's like, Take a look at this role. What do you think about this role? How about this role? And then finally, he said, Rachel, I have a role for you. It reports directly to me. It's this great opportunity working with this new open source community. We're creating open source software. And as soon as I heard, ah, open source, this is a job that has a heart, that, that is something yeah. I can get passionate about, that is a meaningful role. I was like, okay, <laughs> let's talk about it. And I'm so, so I've been at EBSCO. I, Tamir is incredible. It's a great role. It's allowed me to grow and learn more. And again, in the States, it's a little harder and they did take a chance on me because I did not have a background in the library industry, but I have a long background in marketing. So uh, they took a chance and it's been a great match. I mean, the skills are very transferable in marketing. Once you understand your sector, then uh, well, you know, that's, yes. it's an amazing combination, isn't it? You just got to understand your sector. You just got to learn. Well, it. that's what makes me laugh. I think, right. I think in most roles, you want a marketer, the figuring out who your customers are. Yes, there is a learning curve, yeah. but it's not, it's not that difficult a thing to do. And in yeah. fact, I would say for most marketers, it's exciting yeah. to learn a new customer base. You have to have that passion, don't you? And I think that when you, want to learn who your customer is that's when you actually get to know your customer rather than just taking for granted who that customer is every time I think so too yeah. yeah I think I actually think it's well I know this is going to get into some of your other questions but I think it's refreshing when you bring people from other industries in yeah. because like you said they do bring fresh perspectives fresh ideas and they look at, at your industry with fresh eyes yeah and then you realize how incredibly complex it is and you're like yeah yeah we know <laughs> right yeah well that happens in the beginning that's the honeymoon phase when you're like have you done this and have you tried this they're like okay have you heard of this library system did you know that this right. works <laughs> and did you know that you need to be thinking about oh yeah also in the marketing department you know you come in because you're new and you're like why aren't you on this and why aren't we doing this and they're like okay calm down rookie <laughs> yeah, <We're>, yeah. <laughs> we've done that we're good. Great to meet some clients and then they come out and they go Oh yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> exactly. 
<laughs> now you're going to understand the industry and then you know can't just do things like that so um what have you been most proud of then your career i mean you're working working on that holocaust side i mean wow 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 that must have been That's fascinating heartbreaking but empowering yeah um a lot of people when they hear or heard that I worked there were like oh my gosh like you just sit and cry all day um it it's a you know you would imagine it's a very difficult place to work it I would say that it's an inspirational place to work the people yeah. that you meet and more like we got to, there are a lot of survivors who give tours there. And so mm -hmm. I, you know, I had the honor of getting to hear their stories, you know, as they're giving tour groups or, you know, speaking to them for articles or things that we were writing. And they're amazing human beings. And the fact that they've gone through something that I, is indescribably horrific mm -hmm. and came out the other side with hope and wanting to make a difference and positive is actually amazing. And I try to explain, I'm like, you know, I don't, my office isn't in the middle of the museum with like these pictures around me. I don't sit and cry all day. I'm like, I get to share these incredible stories or where uh, one survivor didn't realize that his brother was alive after 30 years. Now I'm getting goosebumps. And they, they wow. you know, are reunited. There was a case where I think it was sisters who were both living in Israel, like 20 miles from each other and didn't even know that and were reunited. I mean, they're, yeah, I'm getting, they're, or just, amazing stories like that, that you come home and you're, yeah, you're like, this is unbelievable. And it makes you like, even, even now, I mean, when I, when I get sick or when I get whatever, I working there and working in an organization with students with disabilities, I'm always like, it could be worse. I'm yeah. fine. This is, yeah. this really isn't anything. Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. It's a little uncomfortable for a couple of weeks, but you know what? I'm, I'm it's okay. okay, you know, to feel, you know, down or to feel absolutely, absolutely, um, or, or to feel a lot of self pity. But I think oh, it's sure. also a great way to snap yourself out, isn't it? When you need to snap yourself That's out, what it is. It? when you That's recognize exactly. uh, it could be worse. Well, I mean, I'm, you don't get me wrong, I'm a huge fan of self pity, chocolate, <laughs> you know, all that as well. But like you said, then there's the okay stop sobbing on those you know we have this lifetime network here that are just really all sob movies of things happening to women where you just cry i'm like enough lifetime <laughs> movies of chocolate now we remember that this isn't so bad <laughs> love it that is brilliant so i i don't know if i answered your question for you about what you're most proud of in your career or if i probably took you off on a tangent which is more no, than that's me no it, i mean obviously of course that that's amazing i think um what I'm most proud of is the fact, and this is where I was telling you, I hate talking about things that I'm proud of about myself. It makes me feel weird and uncomfortable. Um, but what I'm most proud of, I think, is the fact that I was able to move countries twice and build a professional community in two completely new places, learn completely new cultures, but still land on my feet in the marketing community. Yeah, absolutely. That takes a lot of strength and resilience. And you and I talked earlier about people. And that so, so much chocolate. You. So much chocolate. <laughs> strength, resilience, and chocolate. Chocolate. That's my tagline. <laughs> but you know, that's incredibly unique. So I say this to people, we're all unique. Um, you and I can have the same conversation with someone, but we will have different experiences. And everything we go through is very unique to us. And you would be surprised about how inspiring that you would be to people who would be so frightened to go to another country to think, oh, my gosh, what do I do about setting up? When you say, you know what, this is what I did, blah, blah, blah. And they'd be like, oh, that's amazing. And you'd be like, well, it wasn't amazing. I just did it. But it's, you know, for a lot of people, that really would be something. Yeah, I suppose so. <laughs> it is something very special. Um, so what's, what have you found most challenging then? And I'm guessing it's not going to be working for Tamir because, you know, who's your friend? Cause that seems to be going down a treat. Yeah. You know, and I, I will, before I answer, I will, I will say that, you know, he and I had a very honest conversation before I started that, you know, this can go one of two ways, mm. you know, and 
it would have been a shame to lose him and his wife as our dear friends, you know, who we've known for years. Um, so we always sort of have this pact that we have to be open and honest with each other. If something's not working, we have to say it. We have to just really, I don't think we've ever had to have a conversation like that because the two of us have a very similar work style, a similar leadership style. Um, it's been nothing but honestly a pleasure working for Tamir, really. Um, so I was blessed. Um, so that he's definitely, yeah, that's definitely not a challenge. And this might not surprise you to hear that I think my biggest challenge is being a woman. Um, <laughs> I thought you were going to say about your cats, working with your cats, jumping up on the top. <laughs> that, that would definitely be one of the top two. Luckily, they're being pretty quiet right now. But yeah, it's definitely <laughs> challenging as well. I think, I mean, I don't need to tell you that, you know, as, as a woman, I just think we have so many more um hoops that we have to jump through to prove ourselves mm -hmm. and I think there are so many systems in place that make it difficult for us to rise to the top even though we deserve to be yeah. um I, really I think you know there are still a lot of places that are very much as we say you know a boys club where oh, yeah you have to claw your way into that group and you have to take a lot of crap while you're there yeah. to you know to get your your place and I think that there are still just these impossible expectations on women. Like, you know, when I had my kids, there's this, you know, there's just judgment everywhere. You get judged yeah. for staying home with your kids. You get judged for going back to work. You get yeah. judged for doing both. You have to be just the perfect superwoman where you're, you know, if you are working, you have to be the perfect worker, but you also have to be the perfect mom. And they have to, you know, you have to have your kids doing all the perfect activities. And that's so stressful. Yeah. And so to me, that's honestly been the biggest challenge. And just coming to the realization as I've aged that I don't really care what other people think about what my yeah. life's path is because everyone is different. Everyone does it in their own way and in a way that works for them. And if someone wants to judge me, that's on them because they're having their own issues. And I just have to understand that it's not about me. It's about them and maybe their own guilty feelings. Absolutely. We are in control of our own emotions most of the time. Right. And um, we can control how we feel about how people feel about us. And you're absolutely right. You know, when we're younger, we worry so much about what are people thinking? And, and I mean, you know, unless they're of someone of real significance, who cares? Right. As long as you're doing right and you're being good, um, you know, what's the problem? And I and I yeah, I, I completely I think as 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 a fellow woman, I completely agree with you that about the challenge and we both will have been through different challenges throughout our lives. I think the only positive um, or one of the significant positives that we can take from it is that, you know, when we start looking at EDI and we start thinking about diversity in different groups, progressively, we are further on in terms of acceptance than someone, say, who's non-binary. So I think it's, um, you know, there we've, we've gone through a lot of stuff and you and I have gone through, we haven't gone through stuff that people went through decades and decades ago. And it just shows change can happen. And I really hope that my little girl grows up in a world where people don't judge each other the same. And I hope that your children grow up in a world where people are less judgmental because that's, that's what we, you and I have grown up in, is that judgmental side and that, you know, the old boys club. Yeah, I will, I'll say, you know, I've been really inspired by watching my daughter and her group of female friends. Yeah. Um, they encourage and support each other in a way that I don't think women our age knew how to do for each other. You yeah. know, I remember my girlfriends um, in high school were kind of, and again, I think we were just modeling this and this is the way that we were taught to treat each other. I'm not, this is what we knew, you know, it was yeah. kind of, there was the backstabbing and there was jealousy and there was I, this two-facedness that I don't see in my daughter and her friends. And I love it. I love how they encourage each other and they compliment yeah. each other and they support each other. And it's taken me decades to have friends like that yeah. um, and to learn to have those healthy relationships with other women as well. And seeing that my daughter just naturally has that with her friends, it makes me want to cry tears of joy. I'm happy for their generation that they have that. And like, like you're saying, it's, I think that there, it has ch things do change every generation and it's really, I just hope it keeps going. Uh, and like absolutely. you said, not, not just for women, but for everyone. 
And it, and it will never be perfect, but it needs to be better. Yeah, that's right. Absolutely. So um, what's your ultimate career goal? President of EBSCO? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny because, again, when I was younger, I was like, I'm going to be CEO of a company. I don't want that anymore. Um, <laughs> now you've got an senior right? like. And exactly. It's, that's not for me. Um, I will say, though, that for me, well, really, my ultimate goal is to be happy, you know, in, in what I'm doing and feel passionate about what I'm doing. Um, I would ultimately, and again, I always feel because I did take that seven-year hiatus in my marketing career, I always feel like I'm seven years back and I get, I talk a lot with Tamir about this, how I get frustrated sometimes because I really feel that I should be leading a marketing team at this point. I have the expertise. I have the background to do it. And I love it. So my ultimate goal would be leading a marketing team. Um, one of my most favorite things in the world is being a mentor mm. to younger, the younger people, to, to younger folks getting started out in marketing and just in general, it's just a role I, I love. So um, I love leading teams and I love serving in that sort of Met, I guess mentor role so yeah. I think that would be that's something that I'm that I'm building toward and again the second component of that would be doing it for a place that I love but also whose mission I identify with and I just I can't work for companies or anywhere where I don't feel passion for the product and for what they're doing and it has to be something that's doesn't have to be life-changing or world-changing but something that's doing some good for the world yeah it's very important, but you can tell that that's that you're working somewhere it has to be it has to be something close to your heart. Because like when you talked about when the right role came up at EBSCO, you know, it was specifically, you know, open source. So you that's knew exactly right. how important that was, this open kind of collaborative, open environment. Um, so if money was no object, uh, what would you be? OK. So I've had this dream for probably a decade now, maybe more. If, if I win the lottery surgeon. someday, I swear not a brain surgeon or not an eagle, although flying would still be really cool. And I do still have dreams where I'm flying. Um, <laughs> I'm never going to give up on that dream. But if money were no object, I would love to start a nonprofit for um, single moms mm. where I just, I have this whole thing in my brain where I'd love to start some sort of a co-op situation for women who, to help women get out of these cycles where they either feel that they have to stay in an awful, abusive, or some other type of relationship because financially they can't get out of it, you know, or single women who are already in that situation that they're at, you know, they're either not by choice or by choice raising children on their own and just can't get out of this cycle of, of poverty or moving up in the world. And so I'd love to start, I just have in my mind just investing in buildings that could be like a co-op situation where single moms have each other. So they'd have their own network where, wow. you know, if, if they could watch each other's kids and not have to worry about money and just have this support network, but also have a network, a nonprofit organization in there, helping them build management skills and helping them go back to school and training them and getting them kind of out of getting them to where they want to be in their lives. So, and I just, yeah. Um, and I, I just envision this, a business going along with that, that could kind of funnel women in that had actual like health insurance and good benefits for them. So let them bring their children to work. You know, I, that's what I would do if I had all the money in the world. Because we know now we can have our children at home as disruptive as they are. We know we can manage it. So bring your children to work. It's possible. It, it, you know, it obviously would depend on what the business is, but it's or like or some remote opportunities, but some way where they can get by, have their children, but also move up in the world and, you know, be able to support themselves in a respectful way and feel empowered. Yeah, it's very important for self-worth, isn't it? And to actually be given opportunities that wouldn't normally be available to them. Oh, I love that. That's really that's, really, that's my dream. Yeah, that's that's very, very special very special that so, and my second my second oh, yeah. dream is owning a house with an enormous backyard where I could adopt 
all the homeless dogs and all the homeless cats and all the homeless llamas and donkeys and just have them in my yard. I love I think, animals. I think you don't need a house with a big backyard. I think you need a farm. Uh, yes. <laughs> because I your neighbors right. are probably not going to love all the dogs next door, you know, barking. No, yeah. Just yeah, it would definitely need to be on a huge plot of land away from other people. Thousands of acres. Yeah. And yes. people to manage all these animals as well to help that's you. My, that's my other dream. Oh, brilliant. I love it. You can just go around on a little, go- um, what's they called, golf carts. and just. <laughs> I would do that. Yeah. You just have about 500 dogs following you. <laughs> <laughs> I would be okay with that. Come on, boys. Come yep. on, girls. Let's go. <laughs> um, so, um, what, so I asked this question, and sometimes people um, uh, don't necessarily read books anymore, professional books. They'll read blogs and lots of different things but I'm going to ask you anyway and you can say yes or no Uh, so which inspiring three professional books would you say are a must read and why yeah I yes you're you're right I I no longer read a lot of professional books I used to when I was younger um I will say that again I'm by no means an expert I don't think anyone is I think everyone has their own opinion on how to do marketing best and most other professions as well I think it's interesting to read and understand those perspectives but I think after a certain time you have to have your own perspective and your own view and I think really what's important in marketing as probably in most jobs once you learn what the best practices are yeah. Uh, this is similar to the authors writing these books. You learn rules, how to write, how to, how to construct a paragraph, how to write a chapter. And then the best authors, the best movie makers, the best screenwriters are the ones who take all those rules, break them apart and create new genres. And those are the ones who are winning all the awards and people are going to buy. Those are the New York Times bestsellers. I feel mm-hmm. the same way about marketing. It's great to read these books and understand them. But then I want to come in. And I want to break all those rules and try something new because if yeah. everybody's doing the same best practices. It's boring. Yeah. <laughs> People are You've used got a to best it practice is like a benchmark, isn't it? Best practice. Exactly. But there should be benchmarks. You, you try it, but you build on it and you make it better or you just keep evolving it. And if you're a marketer and you get stuck in a rut of doing the same thing and you're not testing and you're not changing and you're not seeing if it's worked or something else is better, or maybe what you did was working great before, go back to it. If you're not doing that, how do you know? You've got to do it. Well, and that goes back to what we were discussing before, where I think that's why it's great to bring marketers in from other sectors, because it's they're going to bring in these fresh new ideas and perspectives and want to try something different. And hopefully people aren't scared by that. That's another reason I love working with Tamir and EBSCO is I'm always coming up with crazy ideas all the time. And they, I never get shut down. They're always like, sure, try it. Sure. Great. I love it. And why not? You know, and one of them fails. Okay. You know, it's not the end of the world. That didn't work for our market. Okay. Let's try something else. Oh, that worked. But how would you know if you didn't try it? So I I will say that the book that was recommended to me by another friend in the industry that I read that it goes along with this is called the Medici effect. Okay. And it's not necessarily just a marketing book, but it's talking about how during the time of the Medici's in Italy, there was this this renaissance of ideas. And they sort of talk about the reason why was because they took people from all different professions, put them together in one house and had them all collaborate. And why was it so successful was because they all had different areas of expertise and ideas. And so all these crazy new ideas came out of it because they weren't just lumping all the marketers are here, all the architects are in their little silo. Once people start collaborating together, that's when cool things happen. So that, I think that's a great book to read. And it's just an idea that I just, I think makes a lot of sense. And I try to live by that at work and in life as well. Yeah. No, that's brilliant. And I haven't heard of that book. So in terms of like, it's a great book. And in terms of podcasts and other things that I'm sort of reading, there's there's one person, his name's Jay Akunzo, who I've followed for years. Um, I met him here locally through a local content marketing group, because again, I like to get out and stretch my wings, see what other people are doing outside of where I'm working. I, I think it's, um, kind of, it's like a breath of fresh air. So he started this content marketing group locally in Boston. Now he's nationally known. He's on the speaking tour. He's written a book, but he puts out newsletters that go along exactly with 
what I've been saying, I think it's called Breaking the Wheel, this wonderful uh, newsletter that he puts out talking about. And he highlights in his podcasts, marketers who've kind of gone beyond and done their own thing, tried something totally different. Love it. Here's how it was a success. And so I, I love his thinking and I, I'm a huge proponent of that as well. And I think, yeah, it's, it's good. It's refreshing to read other people who are saying the same thing and giving just these amazing examples of how people are doing it. I haven't, I haven't heard of him, so I'm definitely going to check him out. He sounds like someone that I would take a lot of inspiration and probably get a lot of um, ideas from. I think you would. I, he's, I, I like that he challenges this, the status quo constantly, and he, he challenges everyone to do that. So, yeah, I think I, can, I will pass along some links. Brilliant. Yeah, that's perfect. Because anything that you talk about, we include as, in links and description as well and in the transcript. Oh, excellent. If you could travel back in time with a time machine, one day it may just happen. What I'm really interested about this one, after what we were talking about earlier, what would you tell your early career self? I would tell myself, I don't know why. I think in the beginning I was just so mystified. It was was new. I was young. I didn't ask enough questions and I wasn't curious enough. Um, Or... I don't know what held me back, but now when I, you know, I like, you need to dig deep into things and understand them and your job, you need to, I don't think in my first job, I even understood who the customers were yeah. that we were selling the product to, even though I was the yeah. only marketer. Um, so maybe it was me that caused the company to go bankrupt. I don't know. Um, I, you I, know I don't I, think so. <laughs> um, but I, I, I'm not sure. I, I, I think, again, I was, I was just young. And it didn't occur to me. Um, now I really like asking big questions and understanding and challenging. And I wish I would have done more of that earlier on. I think I would have moved forward much quicker if I would have asked bigger questions sooner. Yeah, absolutely. I've just thought of another question to ask you, which is just off topic, but I'll see you in time. Good. I might, I might start throwing this into uh, conversations, um, these podcasts when I'm having them with uh, people who work in marketing. So what is the best piece of advice that you have ever been given? In terms of marketing or in life? In life? Could be, yeah, could be life. Could be marketing, could be life. Okay. <laughs> the best piece of advice, this is hilarious. I've ever been given is by my father um, (laughs) who told me you really need to save money. (laughs) I'm not kidding. You need to say this is like a resounding thing about you need to save. You never know if your company is going to go bankrupt. You don't know if there's going to be a year like COVID where, you know, people get laid off. It's always good to have that reserve in the back. Because you just, you don't, you don't know, you don't know. It might look like a company's doing amazing. And all of a sudden, you know, we just got a notification yesterday that there is this farm stand. It's enormous in our, in the next town over that is people come from, I don't like, they'll drive an hour to go there. They bring, their niche is that they bring international produce. So we have a lot of diverse um, immigrant communities who live around the Boston area yeah. So they, they bring really hard to find vegetables from, from Asia. They bring these Israeli vegetables that we use, you know, for especially there's a specific fruit that we need for the way that we prepare our, um, our Passover Seder. My husband's family is North African Jews. There's this one fruit you can only find there. Um, and a lot of communities go there and we just got a notification that they're closing. And it was because we're like, how? It's always packed. They just expanded the owner who's like 85 years old is retiring. He's, you know, and so all the employees are out of work. Now we no longer, uh, it's, so you just, mm. kind of, it's a flourishing business. So you just, you don't know. Um, so I, I, I actually think that's, it's very practical, helpful advice. And it was also taught, you know, he said, I wish I would have had money put away for when you children went to university. Um, instead, I was, you know, writing out these monthly checks and it hurt. So that always, resonated for me too. Yeah. You just never know what's going to happen. And it's just good that you have some money put away. So you're not, you know, sobbing and eating chocolate for six months with no plan. <laughs> <laughs> 
I think that's probably advice that a lot of parents give a lot of children. <laughs> we, we certainly, certainly do. Yeah, whatever. Get a pension. <laughs> and I actually listened and I told him that. I always remind him. I'm like, I, those were really words to live by. <laughs> I do listen to you sometimes, Dad. <laughs> and some great advice from my mother <laughs> was, it's so, it seems so silly, but when she was teaching me how to drive, when you see the brake lights on the car in front of you, put on your brakes too. <laughs> Not silly, stupid little advice, but so it right. sounds common sense, you know, but actually it'll save your life. <laughs> it was one of the first things I told my daughter when we get in the when we got in the car. <laughs> very, very advice sound advice. Oh, it's brilliant. <laughs> so what's your number one tip for anybody working in marketing right now? I would say I don't know if I have a number one tip, but I think it's really important to be yourself and use the talents and the skills that you have. I think again, it's like we've been talking about here. Everyone is different. Everyone has their own backgrounds, their own story, their own things that they're good at. And I think you need to take that and use it always in your job to your advantage. Yeah. No one else is like you and no one can do the job like you're doing it. And so don't try to be like anyone else and imitate anyone else. Do it like you. Yeah. I feel like I'm looking in a mirror. <laughs> I love that. I feel like it's, you know, me talking to me. It's brilliant. <laughs> that's great. Oh, that's that's incredibly sound advice. And I think you're absolutely right in terms of um, appreciating the colleagues and the people that you have around you and how you can improve situations with their knowledge and expertise and it's respectfulness isn't it it's respecting your colleagues and those people around you about what they bring to the table and what they what they have to give yeah absolutely so what do you miss most since the COVID-19 pandemic because it's been a bit different for everybody in terms of you know um lockdowns and not lockdowns and all this and we've all been in these funny old situations we were on lockdown for a really long time um and our office has is continues to remain remote so it's been over a year um i miss people the most yeah i do i miss i miss people um professionally i miss my colleagues i miss seeing them every day i think things are going to change uh, when we do go back to the office, uh, most people are going to remain remote. So it's leaving me, you know, it's, it's going to change what, what it looks like working in general. Um, I miss our customers. I miss librarians. I miss going to conferences and seeing everyone. You know, yeah. I work in this folio, this open source community. We usually have face-to-face -face meetings. I really love that community. And I really miss seeing those people. Um, that's yeah. what I miss the most is people. Library communities are incredible. And as I've said to someone previously before in these, when when I stepped out of the industry for six months and took a bit of a career break because a bit burnt out, I just absolutely miss that community so much. And they're so incredibly special. And what's been interesting speaking to um, people who work in library teams is over the past year is how many of them haven't seen each other or spoken to each other when they were working physically in the same library they would see each other every day but because of how different roles are in library teams now and the different hats that information professionals have to wear some of them would be like people that i used to see every day i haven't spoken to them in about a year and you're like wow it's so it's Sad. It really yeah, very, very. So, like, yeah. It's is there funny. anything? Yeah, sorry. I was going to say it's interesting because I don't even, it's weird for me to call librarians even our customers because I just feel like, first of all, I think customers, they're people yeah. and they're, they're, librarians are just this amazing community of human beings. I just think, again, I, I, that's why I feel so lucky to be doing what I'm doing, it's particularly in my role where I get to be so embedded in that community. Yeah, um, yeah I just, I miss them. <laughs> yeah, I know that I, yeah, some of them I have as some uh, people who work in libraries, I have as friends and um, incredible people, just incredibly diverse range of people as well. It's probably one of the most diverse um, 
or it's one yes yeah, probably one of the most diverse communities that I've ever worked with and had the privilege of working with and also I'm a, a chair of a local regional committee of information professionals and um yeah they're just brilliant and libraries what amazing places and how they have really gone through and in some respects thrived in this last year and a half and it's been amazing to see the innovative campaigns that they've done also the different programs that they've done to get users to watch them virtually and all the different like children's reading classes and you know I see like um some librarians doing TikTok and you know I just think wow you've really embraced this and it's 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 amazing it is amazing and I will say you're right the the way that they so quickly got up and running online was amazing yeah. But the day that I went to return a book to my local library and the doors were open and they said that they reopened, I actually had tears in my eyes. It yeah. felt so good to get back into my library and just to be able to, I like to just browse. I like to browse books. It was very hard for me just to order books online and go pick them up because I like seeing what the librarians suggest. Yeah. I like looking at the displays. Yeah. It's, it felt, I'm, I can't even imagine how it felt for them to reopen. Yeah. I mean, just to see people and have people inside, except with all the COVID restrictions that they'd have to do. You know, I remember seeing so many discussions and we have it here in Wales in the UK with the Welsh government and what they're, um, you know, how about sanitising books and, you know, thinking about that whole process of what do we do with books when they come back in? Do you leave them in a certain room for a couple of days or do you sanitise them? And then that whole conversations that were happening. But yeah, it's um, so... You know, fingers crossed we'll start coming out the other end soon, but you're absolutely right. It's wonderful to see them back open again. They're they're incredible hubs. They are so important. And I hope that now when they suffered so much from lack of footfall um, and getting people in, people really recognise and value certain services like libraries, cinemas, all those kind of things that, you know, was people waning, people's interests were waning. They went Netflix and all that. But to actually physically go somewhere like that, uh, people really value that more. And I think that's that's an amazing opportunity for libraries and other services. Absolutely. So I I don't know if you're going to ask me anything from what we've talked about. Maybe you're going to say no, and I'll be like, yay! But is there well, enough? No. Like, Sorry, but me. <laughs> no, because after our conversation, I have some some questions for you too. Sorry. Oh, oh I thought you said. Sorry, no, you don't. You should be super excited because I have some questions for you. That it's so. I'm just sort of wondering. You know, you asked me, but I want to know what have been some of your biggest challenges. Uh, I think some of my biggest challenges in in my professional career would be redundancy. Um, I think having that mindset shifting your mindset to thinking it's not personal you are just a number at the end of the day businesses need to survive and thrive and um it's not that you didn't do a great job it's just that there's no need for your job anymore and things have been restructured so i think that that for me has been the big challenge because i've been in redundancy situation three times and twice i've been made redundant um and that really has helped me to grow as a person. And I think the other challenge, the biggest challenge was actually, and it was because of redundancy, was taking the inspiration to set up on my own and be a consultant and then turn that into a company and start employing staff, which is absolutely (laughs) frightening. (laughs) Amazing. Um, Because you're suddenly responsible for people. um, But, yeah, it's it's absolutely life changing. And unless someone is going to offer me an enormous sum of money to go back and work for someone, it's unlikely that I ever would. Because I like being my own boss. I like just answering to myself and my clients. (laughs) That's that's good for me. (laughs) Well, that was going to be my follow up question, but I think you probably answered it. I was going to ask what you're most proud of. Is that what you're most proud of? (sighs) What am I most proud of? I don't I, I don't have any regrets. I have certainly made mistakes. I think I was talking to someone yesterday and it was interesting. They were saying in their organization, which is a publisher, that they have something called Blunder Club. 
and it's a um, it's a club where they interview senior leaders and they talk about what mistakes that they've made and then what was the repercussions of that. And um, someone in a committee call yesterday mentioned someone who was their boss who said that they did something that got them fired and how they overcame that. And I thought, you know, that's quite fascinating. So in terms of what I'm most proud of when it comes to my professional career, I think part of it is, is the amazing team that I have with me and that the special individuals. Um, but I think it is probably just being able to do what I've done and start up a company and just because sometimes I just wake up and want to pinch myself and I'm like oh my gosh I, I actually run a company with people that is just insane I mean who would want me as a boss <laughs> but yeah so that's probably professionally one of the things that I'm most proud of See, that's that that's that imposter syndrome coming through again oh yeah yeah totally that, that, that like you and I talked about um, what everyone didn't hear earlier was we were talking about how sometimes in some situations what we're projecting on the outside, which may be confidence internally. Oh, hello, buddy cat. Internally. Okay, well, sorry. <laughs> no, love it. Internally, maybe something completely different going on, which is usually like, oh, um, yeah. So um, that, that yeah, there's always that. But that shows that you care. Right. So. You've got to yes. be in touch with our emotions. We're not robots. Anyone who says they don't get nervous, I don't believe them. No, I don't believe them either. <laughs> if not, I'm going to make them nervous. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Figure out how to push their buttons. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Any other questions? That was, this was Perfect. Really interesting. That was amazing. So, um, Rachel, I want to thank you so, so much for taking the time to talk to us today. It's been absolutely fascinating. One of my biggest take homes, in fact, there are several, but one of my biggest take homes is just how when you started your career, where you started your career, how you've changed from going from moving between different cultures and different working practices, because what your working practices in Israel were very different to what they are in the US, as for me, working in the UK, you know, culturally, they're very, very different. Um, and that's, that's really awe inspiring for me and quite incredible and how you've managed to now work for EBSCO and really grasp the opportunities available to you, be part of this local content, was it content management group? Content marketing. Content with content marketing group. Um, and um, really exploit those opportunities that are available to you. Um, and I'm so, so sorry that you are no longer going to be able to easily get all the fruit and veg. <laughs> I know. I don't know what we're going to do. Get. You're going to have to plan now about how you're going to get that stuff. We are, it. because it would be a tragedy not to have this special jam. It's quinces. quinces oh, that's it quinces. Oh, yeah. Can't get them here. You just have but to have a quince tree. Thank you so, so much for taking the time to talk to us today. It's been an absolute delight. We will include a link to any of the resources that you mentioned and do send Daddy, me to any I'm links. To granny. Yes, darling, you're going to Granny's. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this is Rachel. Do you want to say hi? Hi. And um, so it. thank you so, so much. I am so happy to be here. Thank you so much for having me. This is really fun.